In the 1920s, an anthropologist named E. Evans Pritchard went to study um, a group in Africa called the Azande. Um, this would have been somewhere around, I think, southern Sudan now. He spent a few years there. The Azande at that time were under some colonial control but still maintained many of their traditions, although this would not last um, long. Um, Evans Pritchard came back and wrote a book uh, called Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic Among the Azande. Uh, gosh, the book is almost, what, 80 years old um, at this point. Evans Pritchard gives us a pretty good sense of the way that Azande society worked. And for the purposes of uh, what we're going to talk about in class today, or what I'm going to talk about uh, in this recording, um, the focus is on how they came to decide matters. Um, now, the Azandi are faced with problems that are not unlike our problems. One, they need to be able to predict the future. Um, for the Azandi, living in a somewhat hilly savanna, one of the problems they had is Floods would come during a rainy season that I don't think still comes to the southern Sudan. I'm not certain. Um, in any case, some of the hills would flood and some wouldn't flood. And there wasn't any particular pattern, no way to know what was going to flood in what particular year. And so one of the things the Azandi needed to know was, where do you build your house? Um, and the thing about predicting the future is, you don't know, and there's no way to know, and you absolutely have to know. So much is riding on it. You know, one day, if the state allows you, you walk down the aisle, and you say, I do. And that I do is not just an I do for you here and now. Uh, you're saying, I will stay with this person uh, for the future. Can you imagine looking back at yourself at 14 and having the person that you were at 14 make decisions for you now that you have to live with right now? Is it going to be any different at 20, 25, 30? At this point in my life, I look back at, and I, I think I've been married about 12 years, you know, the person that I was when I said I do, I've changed somewhat, and so has she. And we've known each other maybe, I don't know, 18 years. There's no way that you can predict how you will change in the future, how that person will change in the future. When you say you do, it is without a doubt a lie. You simply could not know and do not know. But man, you want to know. And when you're walking down that aisle, you want it to be true. And people talk about those jitters you get before you commit to somebody permanently. And I always think that that is you facing the fact that you don't know. And there isn't any way to know. And you're either going to jump or you aren't going to jump. But you're never going to know. But you really, really need to feel like you know. Knowing is everything. If you just knew it was right. Not that you were guessing or you were thinking or you were hoping or you were praying, but that you actually knew that it was right. That's what you need to know. When the Azandi are talking about putting their house, their family, their chickens, the things that are important to them, on one hill or another, man, you want to know. You want to know. And it's the future. And you don't get to know the future. So, you definitely need to know things about the future. And if you don't like the marriage one, you could use, uh, what should I major in? Uh, what should I do as my life's work? Uh, where should I transfer to? Nothing riding on that. And how exactly do you figure out what you should major in before you have the experience of having majored in it? And what school should you transfer to without some sort of intimate knowledge of what it is to go to school in these different places? 
Um, how exactly do you make these decisions without knowing the future? And yet, you have to make the decisions. All right. On the other side, the other thing they really needed to know is the past. That is, one of the things the Azandi were worried about were things that had happened uh, that they weren't privy to. Um, let's take one of the ones that was big for them, adultery. How do you know whether or not the person that you're committed to has been intimate with someone else? Sometimes there's signs, things where you think, well, yeah, I think maybe something's going on. Maybe it's a text message. Maybe it's something else. And you think, hey, you know, maybe something is happening. But you weren't there. How do you know? And before you kiss them, before you hold hands, before you talk all nice-nice, don't you kind of have to know? Or are you just going to sit there and wonder? And yet, there's really no way to know. You can ask them. But if they say no, are you going to believe them? And you can ask the other person if you know, if you have a candidate for that. But are you going to believe the answer? Unless they confess, unless they tell you, how are you going to know? And yet... It can be kind of important. I've seen people go ask their friends, well, do you think that she did this? As if the friends would know. And then they come up with some way of figuring out, well, do you know or don't you know? You need to know about the past. And because you weren't there, and it's already happened, and you don't have a recording, you can't know. But often, you still have to know. What we're looking at with Evans Pritchard's discussion of the Azande and with the class in general is how people come to know different things. In that sense, the class is all about epistemology. So, for the Azande, how do you know? Well, the Azande's world is permeated by magic. They believe that magic is everywhere. It's in inanimate objects, sticks, stones. Um, it's in trees, dirt, air, weather. Uh, it's also in women to a greater degree than it is in men. Um, and that it's not so much that magic does things. Magic isn't really personified in that sort of way. It's not a god in the usual um, way that you have in the West. It's more like magic is a flow. And people can affect the flow, uh, depending upon how much control they can exercise over it. Uh, but nobody really completely dominates the flow or anything like that. But if you want to know where things are going, then you need to know what the flow is. And if you want to know how things have been, then you can tell from the flow. But the flow somehow would have to tell you. And they needed a way to know. The ways that they had to know... Evans Pritchard calls oracles, and we're going to focus on one of those oracles uh, today called the Poison Chicken Oracle. Okay, so the uh, Poison Chicken Oracle. Oracles are a way for magic um, and again, I worry about that becoming like a person or something like that. Like there's this, uh, this uh, person called magic or something. It's not like that. But it's a way for magic to speak. Um, the oracle is a, you know, it's a telephone. It's a conduit. It's a, a tube. Just a way, uh, a way for them to get information. And by them, I mean the Azandi men. Uh, the feeling amongst the Azandi seemed to be that the women were already intuitively uh, connected to magic, and they didn't need uh, oracles in the way the men did. The men really needed them to, at, at best, catch up, I think. Um, so, Azande sexism aside, um, although uh, it definitely permeates the culture, um, here's how it works. A group of men, maybe three or four initially, go out into the sort of sparsely wooded uh, not really a forest, um, but just a bunch of uh, thin trees growing up, I think was the way he described it. 
Um, in any case, they're looking for a particular kind of uh, bug. And when they find the bug, they scrape the ins 